Welcome to Achieve Wealth through Value Add Real Estate Investing. This is the show where the guru hype is banned and you get direct insights from commercial real estate operators. If you're a passive investor, this show can help you better understand investment opportunities. And if you're an active investor, the lessons from each episode can help you to become more effective in your own deals. Now, here's your host, investor and author, James Kandasamy. Hi, audience and listeners. This is James Kandasamy from Achieve Wealth through Value at Real Estate Investing Podcast. Last week, we had Scott Hendricks, who is a wealth manager, and he covered a whole slew of topics ranging from 1031, being a broker dealer, how someone can be a broker dealer in, to raise money legally. He also covered DSTs, right? Delaware Statutory Trust, and you know some of the items of Opportunity Zone. So it was a very, very interesting topic where I learned a lot. And I'm sure if you go back and listen to that, it's going to be a very, very educational as well. Today, I have Yona Weiss from uh, Medicine Spec. Uh, Yona is a business director and uh, Medicine Spec focuses on a lot of things. But primarily, Yona focuses on cost segregation and bonus depreciation, which gives us a huge tax benefit for a lot of commercial asset class uh, investors, right? Yona, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, James, for having me. It's a pleasure to be on your show. I love your show. It's one of the most, I'd say one of the highest quality podcasts in the industry. Absolutely, absolutely. I've been doing this for past uh, six to eight months. And recently, I don't know, it was a surprise to me as well uh, that, you know, one of the uh, I think Radio Public has uh, nominated, not say nominated, they selected uh, this show as one of the uh, top 24 show for real estate investing in 2019, which is a very big surprise for me. So I'm happy that people are finding value in this podcast and I'm learning as well. So Yona, you have been in a lot of podcasts in many, many podcasts. So I definitely want to cover cost segregation, bonus depreciation, but I want to go a lot more deeper into a lot of other aspects of your personal growth and of the uh, tax code itself. Hope you're ready for this. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, awesome, awesome. So at very high level, can you define depreciation? Depreciation, in, in fact, um, usually means something going down in value. But for our uh, intents and purposes, because we're talking real estate here, it's actually just a borrowed term. Okay, It's a tax deduction. It's a tax write-off based on the fact on the principle that things go down in value as time goes on. So the IRS gives you, as a property owner, a tax write-off of the entire value of your property over a certain number of years. And that write-off is called depreciation. Okay, got it, got it. So it becomes much more sweeter when the depreciation is just a paper loss, right? Uh, Rather than an actual losing value of the building. Exactly, exactly. So right. it's different from, from an appraisal standpoint, you know, an appraiser might look at the property and be like, it actually has a lesser value because it is, you know, this many years old. So that's the difference when we're just talking kind of theoretical. Got it, got it. So clarify me if I'm wrong, only in the US, we get depreciation for a property that already been built and used for like 20, 30 years. When someone buy it again, he get a fresh depreciation start. Is that right? I mean, right. all, other, all yeah. other countries is like, if you build new, you, they consider it's getting old and it's depreciating. Is that true? Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I can't say for sure because I'm not really well-versed in every other country's tax, tax laws. But yeah, the US tax code is based on, even if it's used property, you can actually take the, take the tax right off. Which is actually interesting because a lot of people don't know this. You can actually use depreciation on properties in other countries if you're a U.S. taxpayer. So if you own, let's say, you know, a large property in India or wherever, right? You and you're paying U.S. taxes, you can actually take the depreciation deductions from that property on foreign soil. Uh, it's a very little known fact. But it has to go on a different schedule. It's called the ADS, the Alternative Depreciation Schedule, which is a little longer. Instead of 27 years, it's 40 years. So, but yeah, it's that is something unique as well. Oh, I think that's probably a new fact for a lot of people because a lot of people has properties in other countries. And do you know the details on how do you get that depreciation? You just have to work with a CPA and some tax consultant, or how is that? Yeah, I mean, like like all of your depreciation, it should go on your um, you know on your Schedule E, you know, with 
listing the property, and then it just has to ha- be filed on a different um, schedule. Meaning, it, it's a like I said, it's called the alternative depreciation schedule instead yep. of the the regular, which is called the modified adjusted, right? The regular schedule, and the macro schedule, which we go on for most things, like twenty seven and a half years for a residential, thirty nine for commercial. So it's important to you know just note that. And work with a CPA who knows uh, who knows how to do that because yeah, you can get extra tax deductions. And is this depreciation is only for a brick and mortar assets? Is there any other assets like if I buy a gold or if I buy a land? There's of course there's no depreciation, right? It's only for buildings, which is a, a true a brick and mortar. Is there any any other you know investment vehicle that has depreciation other than real estate, which is a brick and mortar? Well, there are other types of um, properties like equipment and and things like that that maybe commercial owners might have, which have depreciation deductions, it's different than the regular uh, depreciation, which we discussed in, in real estate. It's under a different code, the 179 deduction, which you know will apply to a lot of commercial equipment and stuff like that, that you can you can use that deduction to write off business equipment and, and things like that. Or even if you know a large you know, software, you know, any type of business uh, asset that you're buying that's not necessarily property can can be um, deducted and depreciated. Okay, got mm-hmm. it. Got it. Got it. So yeah, that's very interesting because depreciation is one of the most powerful word for you know real estate investing, right? This is I mean, uh, compared to stocks and bonds and you know buying a gold, I mean real estate is something that you know, this has been created by the tax code to say yeah. that, do you know why they do that? Do they, <laughs> is it because all the people in Congress invest in real estate? That's why they, they kept <laughs> depreciation as it is. That's my theory. Um, <laughs> okay. Thanks for being honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it hasn't, it hasn't been corroborated. I haven't done any independent studies or anything like that, but you know, it makes sense to me. That that's, okay. it sounds, you know, it sounds like even a little corrupt, just like speaking about it. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, some people like to say, because it adds to the economy, right? Real estate, the businesses, you're going to be adding jobs and housing and et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, in the end of the day, it, you know, keeping the rich richer is something the government uh, has an interest in. So. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is one of the secrets that when I was working W2, you know, I didn't know about it and I didn't know how much, you know, it impacts your uh, savings, right? Your tax savings, right? So uh, it becomes a huge fact, right? If you're able to depreciate to get some tax savings, you know, and it's all yeah. on paper, there's no real stuff that being depreciated and real estate is, it's, you know, hugely beneficiary of this depreciation, right? So, exactly. Exactly. so what is the reason why land can't be depreciated? So I guess because land never really goes away and land, you know, is kind of a constant status. So you buy a property and the property, see, it's interesting, the, the schedule that the IRS set up that all stuff, and you know, we're going to talk about cost irrigation, which is actually breaking those things down into different categories on different schedules. Um, you know, each, each type of asset has a different lifespan, but the one, you know, and, and there are so many different categories, right? So you have stuff that fits into a 39 year category, stuff that fits into a 27 and a half year category. You have 20 year, 15 year, you know, 10 year, seven year, and all these different things. And and there's lists, you know, in each one of these categories. Land is the one thing that's constant that, you know, it's always going to have a value regardless. And, you know, when you buy a property, even the tax assessor, right? the, The county assessors are going to understand that you're buying land, and you're buying the improvements on that land. And, and the improvements can include buildings, can include landscaping, can include, you know, the personal property that we're going to break down further with the cost seg. But yeah, land um, is just one of those constants that doesn't change. Got so it, got write, it. You can't write that off. Mm. Okay, I'm just thinking whether maybe people don't like land. Maybe the people in Congress doesn't like land. That's why <laughs> they say, okay, forget about land. Let's go and do the building. And yeah, also the- maybe maybe it's also because, I mean, if you think about it, the fact that we're paying property tax on our land is really an admission to the fact that the county really owns the land, mm-hmm. meaning we're really just renting the land in a way. Even though you own a property and you own that and you have the title to that property, but how can the, the county like tax you on it? Because you know, it, it really, you know, in the end of the day, it's still part of that county. Right, it's still part of that governance, and so 
maybe that's why you don't actually get the tax write-off for something that, you know, in all intents and purposes is only being kind of leased from you. Got it. May, make me make sense. Maybe. Make sense. I mean, I, usually when I look at the county records, you know, between land and improvement, improvement is the building on top of the land, right? So usually, right. I don't know, I'm so so well versed with Texas, right? I'm not sure about other states, but usually it's like 80 or 90% is the building and 10% to 20% is the land. Right. Is that uh, generic across all the states? I'd say it's pretty average, like meaning the national average. Mm -hmm. However, uh, there are places where the land is going to be valued at a much higher level. For example, California is crazy. I mean, the land values in California, I've seen up to 60%, like literally, which is crazy. So obviously, the more the land value is, the less the improvements mean, the less you can actually depreciate if you're basing that, um, that, that ratio. So yeah, some certain cities like New York City also, like sometimes the land value is going to be higher just because like that land is worth a lot more. Oh, it's worth a lot more and you can't depreciate, which is absolute reason why everybody should invest in Texas and Florida <laughs> and mid-city, <laughs> not in the coastal side of it because the land is more expensive and they don't really give any depreciation schedule. I, mean, I that's a really good point. I never really thought about that, right? So yeah, that's another reason why, you know, people should investing in uh, places where the land is more expensive. Right? Or, I mean, it's like 50% right off the whole. Right, exactly. Um, right. Okay, interesting. Can you define how does depreciation give a tax benefit for an investor in real estate? So again, depreciation is a write-off, right? I mean, income tax write-off. Income tax write-off means if you make $100,000, okay? So normally you're going to be taxed on that $100,000. If your tax rate is you know, 39%, right? You got to pay $39,000 to the government. Depreciation is a deduction. So also, you know, if you have kids, there's all sorts of deductions that you can take, right? But depreciation is just a deduction right off the top. So let's say your de depreciation deduction from your property is $50,000. So guess what? That's You just cut your income tax liability in half. So now you're only going to have to pay taxes on the 50,000 because 50,000 was your deduction and you took that off your income tax liability, you're left with 50,000 pay tax on, you're going only going to have to pay, right, 19 and a half instead of, uh, instead of 39. Got it, got it, got it. So, I mean, for audience who's listening, I mean, in real estate, I mean, in general, in investment real estate, there's two worlds. One is the investment world and the other one is the tax world. Right. So whatever we are talking right now is what happens on the tax world, right? On the investment world, of course, you get the cash flow and you go and spend it, right? It's like normal. You're not exactly. losing money, right? Whereas in the tax world, the IRS tax code is meant to incentivize a lot of real estate investors. So they do this virtual depreciation, which is basically you're, you know, you're not really losing money, but they're saying you're losing money on paper and they say you are, you know, you are basically not paying taxes for that income. Right. Right. Which is crazy. And in my opinion, this is probably one of the craziest rules in the tax code. Only to trump that, not to use any puns or anything like that, right? To mm -hmm. trump that rule is the, uh, is the real estate professional status. Correct. Which, which is crazy. It's pro I mean, these rules are just, they're made for the wealthy. <laughs> <laughs> the one who invests in real estate, I would say, right? So, um, so let's go back to a, a, a lot more details into this uh, depreciation, yeah. which you're getting a write-off on the yearly basis. And so whatever cash flow we get, let's say your depreciation is more than cash flow, you're basically not paying taxes on it, right? Exactly, exactly. So, and that's really going to be the goal. And that's one of the things that cost segregation, right? And the bonus depreciation especially can help to accomplish. That whatever tax, whatever cash flow that you have, whatever you know, income that you're making is you know, hopefully going to be tax-free income. Got it, got it, got it. So... However, I mean, on every year you're taking depreciation, right? So, but when you sell, you're still doing a depreciation recapture. So, can you explain to me how this whole, you know, whatever you took in the past, let's say five years, right? You're, you're recapturing it back on a sale. How was the whole benefit was just pushed to the sale or what happened? Right. So, a few things happen when you sell a property, okay? Number one thing happens is, right, there's capital gains, which means if you made a profit on that sale, right, you bought it for 100 sold it for 200, you got a gain. Okay. You have to pay tax on that gain. There's also something called depreciation recapture tax. Okay. And again, this is tax. It's not recapture. I mean, you're not paying back. You're just being taxed on the amount of depreciation that you took over the course of ownership. So 
There's different rates at which that depreciation recapture is taxed at. One rate is commonly as, you know, capped at 25%. That's like at the capital gains rate, which is for right, real property, which is for the real estate. However, there is another rate, which is going to be taxed at your ordinary income rate, which is on personal property, which is stuff that we're taking with the cost segregation, which a lot of people don't think about. And it's actually taxed at a higher rate, even and you're taking it more upfront. What ends up happening is, right, just to break it down very simply, we're taking huge deductions in the early years of ownership so that we're basically tax-free. Yes, that does mean that when it comes time to sell, we're going to get hit with tax on the back end. But in that interim, in that meantime, from you know the time you bought it to the time you sold it, hopefully all of that money you're make, keeping cash free, excuse me, tax free, that cash is now worth a lot more, right? This is called the time value of money. It's worth a lot more because you can now use it, you can reinvest it, you can make more compound interest, right, on that money than having to pay it later on. Also, it's your money. So there's this kind of misconception, and I'm just going to digress here for a second. I'll come back to depreciation recapture tax. There's a misconception that you know, you have to pay taxes. And I think this comes to us from being, you know, in the corporate world where we get our paycheck and taxes are automatically deducted, right? As if it's not our money. Okay. We, but so real estate is a way that we're making money, all that cash flow, but we're not taking off the top, right? To give to Uncle Sam. We're keeping as much as we can because it's your money. It's not money you have to pay tax on. You only have to pay tax when you have that tax liability, okay? When you have to pay. But if you have more deductions, then it's your money to keep. Yes, so part of the the real strategy in real estate is kind of deferring, right? Pushing off to a later date. And one of the reasons why that is, is because there are other strategies down the road that can help to negate that taxes as well, okay? So it's better to pay less taxes now and deal with it later because later on you may have other strategies on sale that you wouldn't have had now up front. Okay. And one of those things is a 1031 exchange, which you can now defer capital gains tax and you can defer the depreciation recapture tax also. There's another strategy which is less known, but probably more powerful than a 1031 exchange. And this is called the partial asset disposition, which allows you to claim a lesser value on property that you dispose of because it has less value than it did when you bought it. Okay. Which means like this, if I bought a property for, right. And this comes in in specifically with personal property. Okay. So your furniture. Okay. Let's take, you know, you buy this table, right. This desk I'm sitting at cost $10,000. Now I bought it for $10,000 in five years from now, if I'm depreciating it, Um, on a five-year schedule with cost segregation, then really this has zero tax value. It's no longer, right? Paper, it's no longer worth anything, right, James? Yep, absolutely. When I sell this table with this desk, I can actually write on a tax form that I am disposing of this personal property. It no longer has value to me, okay? Maybe it has $100, something, minimal, just nominal. Now I only pay the depreciation recapture tax on what's left, on the remaining $100 value, okay? So again, this only can happen when you're selling a property. This is only something, or you're disposing of it, okay? If you also, if you renovate it, you can write that off also. But this only happens on the sale, which is a strategy that we can only take later on. Oh, okay. So... What you're saying is even though your depreciation, uh, you have depreciated 100% on top of like taking like 25% of that 100% at sale, now instead of paying 25% recapture, maybe the recapture amount is much lower because some of the things you can say, hey, this is completely useless right now, right? So, you know, I could have taken, but it's useless right now. Yeah, exactly. Even though it's not, but from a tax perspective, it is because you've Mm -hmm. you've depreciated it, right? It's already been used. Now, yeah, so that means even on the depreciation recapture tax at a later mm-hmm. date can actually mm-hmm. be pushed off. Um, okay. there, I, I'll, I'll mention another great strategy, which is mm-hmm. if you're a real estate professional, right? And now you can use your depreciation or your losses to offset your active income as well, right? Once you've offset that active income, you can now use that um, to offset other other taxes like capital gains tax or depreciation recapture tax. So for goodness sakes, if you have a huge losses from this property and then you go and sell the property, guess what? 
you may actually be able to negate all of the all of the tax that would have come from the losses themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that's what we do, right? So, as a real estate <laughs> professional, right? So, and that's what most of the people who are doing you know, large real estate transaction, including a lot of people in Congress, right, uh, is doing. Right, uh, it's all meant to reduce their taxes or pay no taxes or defer it for later on time. But I want to understand one thing. I want to yeah. understand one thing. So, at sale, from what I know, we have to do a twenty-five percent recapture, right? So, but you say that twenty-five percent recapture can be. There's also another part of the recapture, which is at a different rate level. Can you explain what is that 25% recapture and what is the other part? And how do you split between these two recapture? Yeah, without without getting too complicated, because there are actually different, there's like sliding scales and there's different rates involved. But mm-hmm. generally speaking, there's what's called the, you know, the unrealized gain, right? The, the mm-hmm. depreciation recapture on the property itself. Uh-huh. which you haven't depreciated. And so that's on a 25%. And then you have personal property, uh-huh. right? Which is on, a, on the ordinary income rate. Okay. And how much you, what, when you talk about personal property, can you give some example of what is that personal property? Uh, like, like say for an, an apartment, right? In multifamily building. Right. So if you, I mean, again, if you're doing cost segregation, then basically anything that you're segregating out uh-huh. Um, it, you know, most of that stuff falls into the personal property category. So, you know, cabinets, carpeting, right. Fixtures, oh. appliances, all that stuff. Oh, got it. Got it. So, okay. So yeah, we're like, we're going to go into cost segregation. Then hopefully it'll be more clear. So all this time we only talk about depreciation, which is fundamental things in the whole, uh, tax incentive for real estate. Right. So now comes the, what you call, uh, the B grade, I guess, right? In <laughs> earlier we were like at a, at a C grade. Now we be B grade, and we're going to go to the A grade, which is bonus depreciation. Right. So let's talk about the B grade. What do, what is cost segregation, and how does it fall on top of depreciation? It's not really on top of. What it's doing is separating out um, the property into these different lives, right? So if we go back to our regional example, the depreciation, you're getting, you're able to write off the entire value of the building over a 27 and a half year span for apartments, right? For other commercial, it's on a 20, on a 39 year schedule. Okay, so that means you buy a property for a million dollars, right? You can now write off, you subtract some for land, right? 10%, 20% for land. And then the remaining $800,000, $900,000, you can now write off as a tax write-off, a paper loss, a little bit every single year. Cost segregation allows... According to the tax code, you can have an engineer come to the property and actually allocate every tiny detail of that property into different categories, which depreciate on faster scales, on faster rates. So you have stuff that depreciates on a five-year schedule, um, like, like I mentioned, all that personal property, right? Furniture, right? Fixtures, appliances, right? Carpeting, cabinets, all that stuff. If you put on a five-year schedule, that means that you can literally take and write that entire value off, take as a tax deduction in those first five years. Instead of lumping it all together in the, uh, you know, with the entire million dollars, you're going to take 20%, let's say, $200,000, and now take that as a write-off in the first five years. So just to give uh, some uh, education for audience, so depreciation on real estate, especially on residential real estate, is usually they do, it goes across 27.5 years, right? Uh, right? And then what you're saying, cost segregation, they said, oh, not everything in this building is 27.5. Now we have windows, we have appliances, we have uh, carpet, which we want to depreciate, for example, in five years, right? Then there's driveway where they say, oh, it's seven-year depreciation, right? And then I can't remember what's the 15 years. Can you give me some examples? Right. 15, 15 years is, uh, is going to be anything that's considered land improvements. Okay. So land improvements includes, you know, landscaping, Okay. Asphalt, you know, okay. par- parking lots, anything outside of the property that's can, that's you know not considered land, but like you know, fencing. If you have a swimming pool, all that stuff, the concrete, all of that is on a fifteen-year schedule. Got it. So they split to five, seven, fifteen, and they start depreciating. Very interesting. So does it matter whether you are doing this cost segregation on a on a major rehab project versus a project that's no rehab? You can definitely get more benefits when you're doing a rehab. Um, because when you are adding any money to the property, that money being added in the cap, you know, capital expenditures is going to be added to that basis, meaning added to the books and now going to depreciate that amount of money as well, because that's going into the property. So if you, again, if you bought this building for a million dollars, right, 
and then you went and added another $500,000 in renovations, that $500,000 now gets depreciated as well. So you can cost segregate that as well and break that up into the different um, components. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. I mean, we do a lot of rehab projects and I just never understood whether, uh, you know, uh, whether we should do more rehab will be more better. But what you're saying Absolutely. is just in- increases the value and you get a bigger depreciation compared to... And not only that, but yeah, you can, you know, we're not, not going to get ahead of ourselves because now we're not at the A level yet. But, yeah. you, can, you know, you can do the... We're going to come back to that. We're going to do... You can do the bonus depreciation, um, you know, on the, on the rehab as well. Got it. Got it. So very interesting. So does it matter if I buy a small 50 units uh, and depreciate versus buying a 300 units and depreciate? For, for any investors in these deals? Um, you know, what do you mean? Does it matter? What, well, let's say, I mean, uh, whether you get more benefit out of it or not. I mean, let's say you, you invest 100,000 into this deal. Does it matter if I invest 100,000 into a small 50 units versus whether I put 100,000 into a 300 units? Right. It's not, it's going to be, you know, pretty, pretty much within the same, okay. same scale. Okay. Um, because multifamily properties in general, if they're the same type of style, the percentages are going to be you know, pretty similar within a window. So anywhere between, I'd say 20 to 35% is going to be your general cost segregation, the reallocation of the assets, the faster lives. Um, you know, there are going to be, each property is going to be different. But um, generally speaking, it's, it's going to be pretty similar. Okay. So it's basically based on percentage and the scale. Correct. Of okay. I, I never understood right. that. Because so again, if I, it's a million dollar property, right? And you're putting $100,000, right? You have 10%. If it's a, if it's a $10 million property, you put 100000 your percentage of ownership is going to be a lot less. Correct. Correct. Yeah, because I have some investors who said I only invest in 300 plus units and I never understand why, <laughs> right? So, because sometimes, I mean, a lot of times some of the smaller property makes a lot more money, right? And, and uh, you know, sometimes they just want to do the bigger one. So I always think that there must be some kind of tax benefit that they're doing it, right? But it's at the end of the day, it's just percentage of whatever equity that you are getting, I guess. Right? Okay. Correct. Got it, got it. So is there any tips and tricks for uh, multifamily investors or any value-add investors uh, when they're rehabbing their project, right? For example, I met someone the other day where they said uh, you get you are able to write off address plate of a unit, like say unit one or two. Mm-hmm. If, if the address plate is on a metal, they say that you can write it off as part of a tax de- a depreciation. But whereas if you go and you know put a sticker or carved out the number, you don't, you're not able to do that. that was a huge thing for me. Is that, yeah. <laughs> is that true? I mean, uh, do you get some kind of benefit when you do that? Yeah, I mean, that is true. Again, that, that's part of the um, part of the five-year assets that an engineer okay. could come and recognize what that is. And there are, you know, tons of things like that, you know, whether it's going to be what type of flooring you're putting in. Right. If okay. Let's let's go into that flooring. What flooring will give you the biggest uh, bonus? To pre- uh, right. So uh, so carpeting. Segment. Right. Carpeting is five year property. Um, vinyl flooring is 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 five year property. But if you're going to do real tiles, uh, for example, right, that's considered actually part of the part of the structure. And so oh, that's okay. going to go on the twenty seven and a half year component. So doing carpet and vinyl will be beneficial than than, than tiles in and uh, cost like the pre- depreciation. Much more, okay. yeah, because that's actually a, one of the high value. Um, components, if you think about it, in in each unit, like think about how much you spend on on flooring. Yeah, absolutely. Flooring is one of the biggest expenses, especially on a major rehab, right? Uh, exactly. Right. So, so that's a really good benefit that I never really thought of because I do have properties with tiles, and I never really think about converting it. I mean, of course, we don't do it for the sake of you know getting depreciation, right? But it's just a you know bonus, I guess. Right? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what else is there that you you know come up? come out to you that you think, hey, you know, you, you know, to get these small, small benefits of uh, depreciation, you should, you guys should look at that. What else in a value at rehab? What about appliances? Is a white versus a black appliances? Does it matter? <laughs> <laughs> versus stainless steel? <laughs> Always go with the black. Always, Always go, with, go the black. with the black. It looks better, depreciate <laughs> more, I guess. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Yeah, I don't know. if uh, You know, it, it's all going to, I would say just be, um, you know, be studious. Be careful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. With you know what you're spending, make sure that you know you want to consult a tax advisor who okay. is savvy in this area because you may be leaving a lot of money on the table. You may be leaving huge tax deductions mm-hmm. that you may be able to you know get. And one of the great things about depreciation mm-hmm. is that again we're taking the write off of the entire value of the property 
even if you didn't even spend that from your own pocket, meaning you took that on a loan, you, you took leverage to buy that property, mm. the bank's money, you get the tax write-off for. Oh, that's awesome, right? <laughs> right? Like you think about it, you buy a million dollar property, you put down, you know, maybe 200, right? 250, your own money, but you're getting a tax write-off of a million dollars, which is crazy. So it's too with crazy. the construction, with the renovations, you may get 100% financing for those construction costs and you can write the entire thing off as a tax write-off. Got it, got it. That's very interesting. So let me ask you one more thing. Uh, if if I have a choice, okay, let's say for example, a roof, right? Uh, mm-hmm. It's part of the structure, right? So I, like, if I have a choice to ask the seller to replace the roof before we close on the deal, or should I do it after we close on the deal? Does it make a difference in terms of who gets the depreciation? That that doesn't, I mean, it, obviously not from a depreciation standpoint per se, because mm-hmm. either way you're going to get the deduction because if you buy the property, right, you're, you're buying the roof as well as part of the property, right? If you okay. then go and spend your money, then it's, it's money that you're spending, you know, from your own money um, or from the bank's money, whatever. And then you're going to depreciate that as well. So it, the roof happens to be part of a structural component, which is not going to be eligible to, for bonus depreciation or you know, cost irrigation. It's just going to be part of the main structure of the building, which is depreciated at a later time. So it's not necessarily something that's going to get more, more benefit per se. Yeah, unless the, unless the roof is increasing your price at closing, I guess, right? So Obviously, right. And if, if you have you know, deferred maintenance on, on that end, then you can benefit from Got it, got it, got it. Very interesting. A lot of a lot of strategies that we can do when we're doing a value at a project, right? Which I think is is important to understand because some things can make a lot of difference in terms of your tax benefit, right? So yes. So I want to go a bit more detail into the five, seven, and fifteen years, right? So mm-hmm. what? So because of this, let's say you're depreciating a lot of that five years uh, depreciation on an accelerated schedule, right? And yes. let's say you keep this property for two years. Right after two years, you decided, okay, I'm going to sell it off versus keeping it, uh, you know, more than around five years, right? So, what's the benefit? What's the what's the threshold of benefits of that depreciation versus depreciation recapture that you are getting on how long you hold the property? Again, the threshold, you know, when you're going to look at property to property on an individual basis, okay. so you really have to kind of look at it in a bubble. And, and it's difficult to do. I mean, you may want to do that because the investors are involved, et cetera, uh, in that regard. But even before I answer that, I like to just kind of take a step back and realize that the real benefit of real estate is when you're going to be constantly buying more, right? Because whatever is going to happen to this property, the tax, you know, taxes involved in this one can potentially be deferred and be pushed off with the next property I buy, right? And so that's, that's a viable strategy. Again, we also have to take a step, you know, step forward and look at each property on an individual level as if like, this is the only property I'm ever going to buy. And so if that being said, if it's the only property you're only going to buy, so you have to see, is this going to benefit me? Um, you know, if I hold this for two years, I'm going to take this depreciation up front, and therefore I'm going to get the tax free cash flow um, in the first two years. And then when I sell, I'm going to have, you know, a higher taxes to pay, pay then. Um, so again, that calculation is going to be, going to be is you know obviously going to come up at that point. I would say that you should really take that into consideration. Um, you know, if you're going to a two year hold versus a three year hold, right, or a five year hold, uh, again, the cash flow is the main key to this right to this puzzle. And then if you are refinancing, which is another possibility, then that money coming from the refinance is also tax free. Uh-huh. I mean, it's, it's not a, a taxable event, which means that that money that's coming back to your investors, which you may you know, decide to pay out proceeds from the refinance uh, to the investors will actually increase their returns as well. So it's all part of like a bigger calculation. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Awesome. So let's go to the number A, right? The, the, the king of uh, depreciation now, which was because of the introduction of the Tax uh, Act 2017, right? Uh, right? They introduced bonus depreciation for used property, right? So usually bonus depreciation is only for new properties, right? So can you explain how that was born and what's the, what's the motivation behind it and how does it work 
to become a, a, a great depreciation. <laughs> yeah. So bonus depreciation, uh, 100% bonus depreciation, I should say, is, you know, came about on used property. That means that it used to be only if you built a new building, right? You did new construction, you were able to take a tax write-off of the depreciation of anything that depreciates under 20-year schedule. So again, that goes back to all the stuff we're going to segregate, right? The cost variation, the 15-year land improvements, right? The five-year assets, which are all the personal property, et cetera. All of that stuff can now be eligible um, for bonus depreciation. Now, when you're doing a new build, it used to be only 50% of that. I mean, you could take a 50% in the first year, you could take a deduction of that uh, depreciation. Came the new tax code and said, not only 50, we're going to move it to 100%, which means you can take 100% of, of all of that depreciation and write it off in the first year, okay? And used property, meaning even if it's an old property, you're buying it for the first time. So this is really going to take depreciation to a whole new level, right? It's going to take the first year, instead of like a, on that million dollar property, instead of a $30,000 tax write-off, right, for regular depreciation, and then you're going to move it up with regular cost irrigation, maybe to 60 or 70,000, right, comes bonus depreciation and potentially you're going to get like a 200, you know, $250,000 write-off. Just Very like interesting. 10, 10x is it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And what what's the motivation of the government passing this tax law? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't In, if you know, <laughs> I didn't come here to discuss politics. Uh, <laughs> okay, okay, so we get away from that. So there must be some reason. But no, I don't know. I think again, I think it has to do with the stimulation of the economy, of the economy right? and all that. Okay, got it. Right, the more tax, you know, write-offs, the more money can go back into okay. investing, create mm-hmm. more jobs, create more mm-hmm. housing, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. But it's only limited to until 2023, right? If I'm not mistaken. And after that, from 100% becomes, I can't remember, 50% or 80%. It goes to 80% then starts phasing out um, every year until it's gone. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, it's surprising for me because I do a, I, I did a lot of bonus depreciation for most of my properties. I think right. almost all of it is last year. And everybody like almost like wipe right off their capital when they looked at their K1 and everybody was surprised. I mean, a lot of people understood what it is, but there was a lot of new people who asked me, hey, what happened to my money? Did it disappear? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Everybody's asking for it because they, a lot of them got like almost 90 to hundred percent of write-off and I have to explain to them about the bonus depreciation and all that. So right. I'm going to be doing a webinar soon. I think in the next few weeks, uh, I'm not sure when is this episode going to be aired. Uh, probably will pass the webinar, but if any of you are interested in getting that webinar link uh, to register, because I'm going to get a CPA to to translate all this bonus depreciation into how passive investors will get the benefit out of it because there's a lot of technicality when it comes to you know tax codes right, right? and I want to get exactly. a CPA who specializes in real estate professionals and how does this whole thing benefits uh, everybody in, in investing in real estate including passive investors who are not a real estate professional right because a lot of times real estate professionals well understood but people don't want to know how much how does passive investors get the benefit out of real estate investing and exactly. we'll cover that in the webinar which is going to be a very interesting webinar awesome yona so can you tell our audience how to get all of you the uh, best way to find me is actually linkedin that's that's <laughs> my that's my home base Right? Oh, that's where I, that's <laughs> where I hang out and most of my time. Um, but but seriously, it's um you know you can reach me. My email is a great way to contact me. Y first letter of my first name, the last name Weiss at madisonspecs.com. So S P E C S. Specs actually an acronym for Specialized Property Engineering Cost Irrigation. So that's our firm. And um, yeah, especially if you want, you know, if you have a property you're looking at and you want to see what the potential benefits would be, we do an upfront um, analysis. So you can just kind of see what those numbers, the potential tax benefits would be, whether you're, you know, under contract with a property, you bought a property, you own a property for years, you can, you can see that. So yeah, happy to, happy to do that. And please connect with me on LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And and before I let you go, when is the best time for someone to engage a cost segregation con- firm? Is it before they go under contract, when they're looking at a deal or after they close on the deal? Usually, you know, after they close is the best. I mean, to engage, yep. obviously, you can reach out to me for that estimate, even when you're under contract. It's probably the best time. But, you know, you want to get it done if you need it in the first year, which not everyone needs it in the first year, right? You may buy a property that's totally not profitable. You have no income, right? You don't need this. Then, um, but yeah, if you want to get it done in the first year, soon the sooner the better. Because again, 
when you, you need this for your tax filing, especially if you have investors and you need to send out K-1s, you need to get that out earlier on in the year. The sooner the better uh, you can get it done. Oh, interesting. I didn't, I usually start the first day itself, but what they're saying is, you know, when you need it, the depreciation, I guess, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Awesome, Yona. Very nice to have you on our show. And uh, I learned a lot and I'm sure our audience learned a lot. We go so much into the detail of, you know, the one of the biggest benefit of investing in real estate on top of the cash flow that you get, right? So the depreciation and the cost sag and now, you know, the A-class depreciation of bonus depreciation. Exactly, exactly. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. It was my pleasure and we will see you soon. Absolutely. Thank you. That's it for this episode. If you'd like to learn even more, check out James's free audiobook. It's the audio version of his best selling book on passive investing. You can get the audiobook completely free, along with other valuable resources, by visiting www.achieveinvestmentgroup.com forward slash free audiobook. Also, be sure to join our Facebook group too. To find it, just do a Facebook search for Multifamily Investors Group. Thanks for listening. Join us again for another episode next week. See you then.